Morning, everyone. My name is George, and I'm Greek. Uh, the, the King James Bible, the old traditional King James Bible, is not so popular anymore because it's tough to read. But there's a verse in it that just makes my heart so happy. It says that this gospel came and delivered not only the Greeks, but the barbarians also. <laughs> and so in sharing that I am Greek, I, I leave you with the troublesome this, uh, problem of figuring out what you are. Hey. Um, uh, as a jokes aside, I, I'm, I'm not just, um, I'm finding notes here. Um, I want to thank your pastors um, for the risk taking of inviting a Greek guy who looks like an Arab, lives in Port Elizabeth. I'd like to thank you for that. Um, I wanted to say that we had an amazing time at the unmarried um, initiative on um, Thursday night. That was amazing. Um, I enjoyed gymming uh, with uh, your pastor on Friday. Uh, he's, he's, he's strong. Um, and it seems to me that in his case, every day is legs day. And so that's really awesome. Um, that wasn't me at all. Um, and, uh, and then last night, uh, we had a great conversation with some of your team leaders, elders, uh, core team. I'm not, I'm not sure. Is this core? I don't know what it is. It, um, it's lovely though. So it, it, was, it was really good. So I wanted to say thank you very much. I, I'm, I've enjoyed being at God First City for the first time. I also went to um, your property, the one with the river that runs through it. Oh man, can I just prophesy over your life right now? Just move there. Take tents, take blankets, take lawnmowers, do what you have to, go there. Somewhere where you don't have to, you know, rebuke hooters on the way in and somewhere where you don't have to climb a flight of stairs and hope that you will find peace and joy on the other side. Just get, just get, get there. Get there. Um, uh, it's, going to, it's going to radically transform your church in a positive, positive way. Uh, facilities do make a difference. If you, if you, uh, it would be amazing to say that, well, we're the church, the church is not the building, the building is a building and the church is the people, and all of that is true. But there is that old cheesy architectural quote that says that we shape our buildings and then our buildings shape us, Right? It makes a big difference, and it's been a journey for me uh, in our church in Port Elizabeth. Uh, we are in our uh, third venue in five years, and um, uh, people do get a little frustrated at the changing, but it's all balanced when you see new people come to Christ, find faith, join community, and celebrate life with you. Then the, then the facility just doesn't matter. You just keep expanding and extending it. I'm speaking that over your life. You'll double just by moving. You know that, right? You, you literally don't have to tweak a single thing. You just have to geographically move. Have I pushed this too far, Pastor? It's my view on this. You, 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 really, you really do. It's, it's just one of the, I mean, if you want a spiritual verse for it, i got no problem with that. Go and find bowls and bring the bowls, and when the bowls are full, the oil stops. So keep getting seats. Um, I, I have half an hour, I think. Uh, is, that, is that right, Pastor? Uh, do you guys call him Pastor? Or is that not really just Glenn? Glenn, okay. Big G. Amazing. Um, I, I, I'm on, on, on this mountain climbing phase of my life for some reason, so you're going to be subjected to yet another conversation about mountains and climbing mountains. Um, Ma Matthew chapter 17 uh, is where I'd, I'd like to take a moment. It's, uh, th those of you who've been in the church walk quite a while will know it's the story of the, uh, uh, the transfiguration. And I want to take some ideas out of that on how to grow spiritually and grow others spiritually. And I want to take away some of the myths around growth, because I think there are lots of myths around growth. And I want to talk to you, so I'm hoping to serve your pastor really well. When Ross comes uh, at your next summit, he's much more like organized. 
than me. So you're going to have notes and addendums to the notes and subtitles and uh, you're going to be able to produce a thesis and it's going to have a Gantt chart and a bell graph. And um, I just thank Jesus that that's not me, but that that is him. My goal is to light a fire and inspire and, and build something and then let Ross come and light the fi- build the fireplace so that the fire doesn't burn everything down. But but, but the, conver- the conversation I want to have, here's the thing. I did something terribly wrong in the process of moving from space to space, sp- space to space that I want to share with you and then encourage you to avoid the same mistake. Is that okay? Will you please learn from my error? That would be good. Okay, so here's the mistake I made. I prepared the building really well for people. I didn't prepare people very well for the building. So we spent hours talking about layout and color and plants and trees, 500 of them, in your case. <laughs> we, we, uh, we're in an industrial park. We have razor wire around our building. Um, we, 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 we spent a lot of time talking about feature walls. We, we differentiated which black would go on the wall. It can't be black, black. That's too far, and charcoal is too childish. So we settled on any seed, which is sort of somewhere in the middle. <laughs> Jokes about Fifty Shades of Grey prevailed at the time. Um, and so we had all this conversation, and what would our vibe be, you know? Those Edison bulbs you see uh, with the filaments at the back there, which your grandparents had in their houses, in case you guys think it's a whole new thing. That they were everywhere, and we had to navigate LED versus that, and stage, would it be big? One middle screen, three screens, would the words go on the sides? Or in the, I mean, it was amazing. How many coffee machines? That is a supernatural question you have to answer. And I'm going to give you my advice. There are never enough coffee machines. So, 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 so here's the thing. We, we, we started out obviously with one in the smaller venue. We currently have seven coffee machines. But, but let me tell you why. No, no, no. There's a reason why. There are coffee machines in the second warehouse. We have two warehouses now, one for just church and the other for everything else. There are, there are six, five in that one. Um, and that's where people come for coffee before and after church. Uh, and, and then Seattle has a branch in there and they have two. Um, and then, and then we have, uh, one in the volunteers lounge because you should never serve Jesus, uh, without a cappuccino, um, uh, because you could be grumpy. And then the best investment we ever made, I'm hoping there's someone here who's just going to say, I'll buy six coffee machines for you guys. But, but like, not the, like, not the, like adult coffee. Okay. So, so, and then we have one at the queue for parents who sign up their kids at Kids Church. Because we figured out it takes the 400 kids and their parents 20 minutes to check in in total, and we feel that a parent should be able to get a cup of coffee while they're queuing up to sign their kids into Kids Church. All this revelation as a single senior pastor. I have no wife or kids. I just simply pray for those who do. And, And... and I, I said this at the Unmarried Initiative, don't, don't feel sorry for me because I, I'm, I'm good with this and I'm graced for it. And as is my custom to say this joke, uh, there is something worse than um, being single, and that is wishing you were. <laughs> A pause for effect. I'll just, just wait. Some of you aren't allowed to laugh because... <laughs> don't laugh. You, you, your drive home is going to be awkward. Um, so, so we did all of that, and then we didn't tell people that when you move from a 400-seater to a 1,000-seater or 1,500-seater, it's presently a 2,000-seater, and we see 4,000 people on a Sunday, church is going to change. And we didn't prepare people for that, so we lost 20% of our church just in doing the move. And it was replaced by 50% more people, but I was still sore. It still hurt me. And I found myself wondering if I was in the church I wanted to pastor. Is that too much vulnerability? Are we still good? Simply because I'd forgotten in the pursuit of this to remind both myself and our community that we don't have a right to close the door of salvation behind us after we've entered in. 
Instead, we have the duty of standing at the door as long as we possibly can in this lifetime, holding it open, and if possible, reaching from heaven into hell and pull people towards us. And I'd forgotten to have that conversation while deciding what color black should go on a wall and what type of light bulb should go on. And please still do that. Buy coffee machines, use Edison bulbs, although they're on their way out, try and substitute them with LED. But do whatever you, this is so last season, do whatever you need to do to get an environment. It is important, but don't forget the reason for the environment in the first place. And I know that sometimes people go, hey, man, if you're setting up an environment, is that really authentic? I mean, aren't we, are we genuine or are we just making it up? But the truth is you do it every day. When you invite guests to your home and you're in the middle of an argument, you hit the argument on pause. You stare each other down in a way that only the two of you know what's going on. You bring out your best uh, Woolies plates or ch China is no longer a thing but you bring it out and you serve and you have an understanding that some things should cease fire for the sake of something greater you do the same thing in church when people come in through those doors could you cease fire on your view on the sort of second coming of Christ and could you cease fire on your view of certain things and could you cease fire on your preferences and the loudness of the music and the lights could you cease fire on all that bring your best china out serve people let them have a meal and let them discover the joy you discovered before you started analyzing it That was a half a clap. Could I, could I appeal for a... <laughs> so, so cheesy, I know. Pastors are vulnerable people, let me tell you. Let me, you, you should clap for your pastor. You'll go home feeling fulfilled. <clears throat> um, Matthew 17, are, are, we, are we there? How, how are we doing on time? Oh, good. After uh, six days, Jesus took with him uh, th that I would love to spend just the time talking about the after six days thing. Because if you're a Bible reader, you know that that connects with another six days situation. But we don't have time to, you, you should maybe ask if I could come back sometime. I'd love to come back. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of, G of James, and led him up on a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them and his face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as the light. And just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. How lucky are you that we're here? If you wish, I will put up three shelters or monuments, one for you, one for Moses and one for Elijah. I'll make you equal to these two. <sighs> Have you ever noticed how the disciples just talk out of turn? I mean, this guy has no idea what he's talking about. Right now, he should just keep quiet. But there's old Peter out there with an opinion before the days even started. He's got Jesus. You are so lucky you brought us with to this event. I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to build three things, and we're going to make you, Elisha, and Moses like the same. Jesus is like, oh... Are you still here, Peter? What are you doing here? Uh, piece of advice, there are certain spiritual moments that take place where the best spiritual action is that you keep quiet and take it in. Don't strategize it. Don't monumentize it. Don't define it. Just receive it. Uh, that, that's not part of my message. It's just a thought. Uh, Peter said to Jesus, uh, it's good. Uh, while he was still speaking, I do love that so much. God sort of... Like, it's like God, like when your laptop decides to do an update, whether or not you are in the mood for an, like, I've been warning you now that you must reboot for some time. Some updates could not be installed due to you did not reboot. And you're like, remind tomorrow, remind tomorrow. How many of you like know what I'm talking about right now? Like, remind tomorrow. And then one day you went to sleep and then you woke up and you hit start and then that bar of, I ignored you. I don't care. I don't need your permission for this update. I'm updating you right now. You will wait. Go make coffee. You can swear all you want, but you've been updated. <laughs> well, that is what happens here. 
Peter is still talking, you know. It's the reason why the Bible mentions that, you know. Peter didn't finish his sentence because God in heaven decided, look, let me not allow this guy to embarrass himself any further. <laughs> While he is still speaking, a bright cloud covered over them and a voice from the cloud said, this is my son. This is my son whom I love and am well pleased. Will you please listen to him? Okay, so translate. Peter, shut up. We're doing something big here. <sighs> Are you seeing yourself in the story yet? You're not Jesus in the story. <laughs> <sighs> no, you're not Jesus and you're not God in the story. And Moses and Elisha are just doing a cameo appearance. You are one of the three who came up on the mountain with Jesus and said, it is good that I am part of this church and that you have me here. Let us build something for you. And while you're still talking, God's like, shh, listen to him. Because he's the one I am well pleased. He's not equal to these other two. Let me do an upgrade for you. Okay, can, are we on in an amen state of mind still? Okay, okay. I'm just, I know that like there are two things that determine how long a sermon should be. The clock or the response. And uh, m most preachers follow the clock, which is a bad idea. It is good. It is amen. Oh, is that an amen moment? I don't know what that means emotionally, but... Um, okay, I'll tell you that story just now. While he was still speaking, okay, so download happens. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. Perhaps where they should have started. Because Jesus was already transfigured. And I wonder how much it takes to impress us before we'll bow our knee. And recognize that we are amongst the King of Kings and the Lord. What does it take, you know? What does it take? And so... Um, and then Jesus came and touched them and said, get up, don't be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. And I wonder if this church is in that season of something shifted a little while ago and you get up into a new season and now all you see is Jesus. And if you're wondering who the Elishas are and who the Moseses are in the story, it's pastors and teachers, it's plans and strategies, they have a place. But if you see them equal to Christ the Savior, you need a moment of terrifying kneeling to go, these things are not equal, I see only Jesus. I love my strategy, but my strategy can die when its service is complete if it obstructs my view of my Savior. <clears throat> strategy is never as good as salvation. It's never as good as, I have a strategy by all means, but strategy is second to salvation. So Jesus touches them and says, get up. And as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus said, don't tell anyone. Um, here's, here's my thing. I'd like to share a concept, give you the consequence, and encourage a certain conduct. If I do those things, every time I share, I feel like I've done something useful. And this is the big idea I want to share with you. That when Jesus goes to the top of the mountain, he does not receive his brightness. He reveals it. He was always bright like the light. But at the bottom of the mountain, he dials it down so he can connect with people. And as he got to the top of the mountain, he relaxed and was himself amongst his friends. Jesus didn't get to the top of the mountain and a beam of light like in a Star Trek movie came and struck him and then he became a bright shining Lord and Savior. He was always that. But he knew to dial down the intensity depending on the context of the people around him. We still have this difficulty in Christianity where what we want is to receive more Instead of recognizing that what we need to learn is to reveal more. 
We're very codependent when we should not be. We should become co-laborers. Codependency is a weird thing. I think a lot of Christianity in organized church does more harm than good. Okay, I'll turn around and you can clap so I don't see who. I'll tell you why I think it does more than harm than good at times. I'm a firm believer in the local church, spent my whole adult life in it, pastor an awesome church, love it, want to do more of it. But here's the thing. I think that sometimes the model of church and the philosophy of church is literally no different to a cocaine addiction. All you do is put a man up at the top who gives out a particular brand of the addiction you need. He teaches it in a way that keeps you dependent on his format. So you'll come back every week for your next shot. And you only have to pay 10% of your income to achieve that result. Andy Tula, Zotet, they are right. All right. I know this sounds harsh, and by all means, please be givers because you're not in that kind of church. But sometimes church can become unhealthy because instead of empowering people to stand strong in the faith that they have received, we create a codependent structure where you can't think for yourself, can't hear for yourself, can't understand for yourself. You need a system to stay strong. But the Bible teaches you need the spirit to stay strong. Now you might think, does that not mean we should abandon church? No, exactly the opposite. When strong people gather into a place called church, now you've got capacity to carry weak people. The reason why churches don't want to carry weak people is that they are too burdened trying to stand themselves. I don't tell my church to reach out to others. They're so healthy, they want to. Do do you understand what I'm saying? Why would you not? If you're strong in the spirit of the Lord and in the fullness of his might, the natural instinct of a spiritual person is to say, can I help with that, please? And so you carry one another's burdens and then fulfill the the law of Christ, Galatians 6. But when you can hardly stand yourself, the idea of carrying another is a, 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 a spiritual principle too far a stretch. So here's what I want to encourage you on. Get in your personal life to the top of a mountain and see Jesus and Jesus only. Hear his voice and let the spirit transform your life. When you get down from the mountain, be careful about how much of that you talk about and start looking at people around you and wonder how can you help. We've developed a generation of spiritual people who brag about their spirituality boast about their journey, but won't pick up a burden from anybody else. Amen? Are you still good? Are we okay here? Because I've got another session, and I don't, I don't want you guys to be like thinning out, like, ah, I've got to go root canal this afternoon, so <laughs> I'm skipping your next session. Um, I, 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 I want to encourage a determination in our lives. I see you on a couple of things that will help us prepare for your next move. I believe it's imminent. Your next move is both geographic and it is also spiritual. Amen? I guess secretly what I'm saying is don't let the allure of the geographic move rob you of the opportunity of the spiritual move. (laughs) Because it's exciting, right? Right? But you're going to do so many of those that don't let that rob you of the joy of the spiritual move. So I want to, I want to encourage you on a couple of fundamentals around what that looks like. It becomes important for you to recognize that accepting other people unconditionally does not dilute your spiritual integrity. Unconditional love does not dilute your spiritual integrity. It reinforces it. You prove to me that you are operating in the health of the love of the Lord when your context, environment, and people do not dilute what you have. So an unhealthy response to carrying one another's burdens is to say, if we do that, then I'll have less. 
But that's not true. Because if I give it away, he keeps pouring, pressed down, shaken together and running over, shall be poured into your lap. The receiver is always the one who is the greatest giver, not carrier. We only carry the cross. We keep, we give everything else away. And some people are carrying things like a cross, but it isn't for you to carry. So unconditional acceptance is the thing that makes who Christ was so powerful on the earth. He was still Jesus shining like the bright light at the bottom of the mountain. He just didn't have to show it all the time to prove it. So are you prepared to get in the mud with someone and pick them up? Or are you concerned that the mud would taint the garment of your righteousness? Is that okay? We still good? I think it's so crucial that we get that a space because it's a process. I think the second thing that I want to point out, this unconditional love thing doesn't dilute. The second thing I want to point out is that we should have an unrestricted access to Jesus. So can I give you a little bit of advice I learned along the way, and I think your pastors already get it. Just keep it simple. Keep the process simple. The revealing of who Jesus is to anyone, simple. Don't make it a process that's too complicated. I'm convinced that in church, we create obstacle courses in order to make people prove that they're lovable. Have you done this and that and that? Then you must do that and that. And when you've done that, man, I'm going to hug you. <laughs> Just remember that the person arrived at the door in the hopes of a hug. Make sure you don't ha make them work for, for it. Still do things. Grow things. Go through one, two, three, four, five. Three, five. Do all that after the hug. Not to earn it. <laughs> Not to earn it. Can you say amen to that? I'm going to, uh, I have a few minutes. Is that okay? I do, Right. No, 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 you must guide me because I could do this all day. Is that, is that right? That's right? Okay, so um, he says that now, but on the way uh, to the airport. Um, I'm not sure. They might tag team even. They might go, just one thing. I just thought I should encourage you on. You know? Um Lester, are you taking me to the airport, bro? Okay, cool. Let's go. Um, a man had come to our church. Actually, so I, I was buying clothes from his clothing store. Um, and he and his wife owned the store. And she was quite keen on God in church. And she'd been coming, but he really wasn't. He was just a little bit too cool to need God. And so he figured it's great for his wife. She needs it. Um, gives him a morning to go golfing. It's all good. Was selling me clothes. It's, it really was a relationship that worked very well. Um, but he kind of got intrigued by a few things. So one day, he, after about a year of shopping there, uh, he said, uh, what, what time do you speak? I don't do the singing thing. I find it weird. What time do you sing, do you speak? So I said, well, I, you know, the service starts at 9. I, I get up at 9.30. All the announcements and all the money thing and the singing, it's all done. Sneak in there. It's like, cool. And the money thing is done. It's done. <laughs> Sneak in there. So he did. He snuck in. I saw him. I saw him. I, uh, he snuck at the back there. Barely sat on the chair. I mean, if he had moved any further forward, it would be a medical emergency. And... <laughs> And he sort of seemed to manage through and then uh, get everyone to stand and close in prayer and he ran out. I thought, I'm not going to ask. I'm not going to phone him. I'm going to ask him how it went, nothing. I just kept quiet, let it be. Because the last thing a person wants to hear when they come to church is, oh, I wasn't expecting you here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so that's just my way of saying stop it. Um, and so, and so I, 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 I let it go. And then the following Sunday I noticed... There he is, eh? He's already become spiritual because he's on the same seat. Yeah. 
another trauma you're going to go through when you're in a new venue. Where, orientate me like a homing pigeon. I must find my chair. It was next to the pillar, three from the left to the sabbat. Now what? <laughs> you laugh now, but you're going to cry still. You're going to cry. You're going to test many seats to find out which one has, has your, your, your name on. Anyway, so, so <clears throat> I just remind you that the Son of Man has nowhere to lay down his head uh, while you're agonizing over that. But, um, but uh, uh, he sat in the same chair, and, and, he, and, and he, he didn't run after the service. He, 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 he survived the prayer and sort of casually walked out. A couple of weeks went by of the similar behavior, sitting on the same chair. And then one day he texted me and said, I'm buying coffee at Seattle after the service. You want one? <laughs> okay. Sure. Where must I leave it? I said, we're ridiculous. You bring it to the green room. He said, where is that? Next to the stage. He said, it's very close to the stage. Lightning might strike me. <laughs> I said, it'll be the hottest cup of coffee I've ever had then. Come on in. So he did. We had a good chat. Uh, there is a very important point to the story, and I'm very worried that you're going to hate me for it, so I'm dragging it out as long as possible. Um, and, and he came for a few more weeks, and he made it through a couple of songs. And then he got there at the beginning before, like, the members. Because <laughs> you know that the people who arrive on time at church are visitors. That's how you know. <laughs> Literally, how do, you know if someone's, how do you know if someone's new around here? It's easy. They're here at start time. What I love about a growing church is you've got to grow your church, Glenn, to the size where there are not enough seats. Then you have an emotional conflict in your congregation between I want my seat and I want to be as late as possible. Now, if you over choose this one, you lose that one. And then you're in a tremendous emotional conflict. And usually the chair wins. And so the people come early for their chair. Now that's what happens. I'm going to do a thesis someday on this. I mean, I just, I'm going to do a thesis on like the, uh, yeah, the peculiar people has finally got a definition. Um, he phoned me one day and he said, are you popping in for some clothes? I want to have a chat to you about church. I said, sure. Popped in, bought a golf shirt. Uh, he said, um, I've, I've enjoyed the singing. I was broken. I thought I was so good at reaching the unchurched, and it's like, yeah, the songs are lacquer, eh? If he had started coming to the songs and then leaving at the message, friendship over. He said, I played electric guitar in a band, and I'm quite good at it, and I was wondering if I could join the band. Now, <clears throat> let me just stand back here. There's the holiness of something that strikes us. He is not born again as far as he is aware of it. And that statement is more theological than you realize. Because his name was written in a book before he knew about it. And this is another story on another day. I'll move on. Eh? Uh, so what he would like, are you want me back? Oh, I want to talk about this one. I really want to, oh, I want to talk about it so badly. Um, and he's not born again. I come from the Assemblies of God background. Those of you who are Pentecostal, you know what, what that is? Pentecostal, you had to speak in tongues in order to prove you had the Spirit. Good. And then we read the rest of 1 Corinthians 12, and then <laughs> messed up our brains. It's like, ah, there's more. And then, then you get to 1 Corinthians 14, 1, that says, actually, like, Prophecy is better than tongues. And then you go a little further and he's like trying to talk in tongues in public. And I'm like, why did they stop at chapter 11? <laughs> Saved me a lot of problems. Um, 
And at the beginning, I didn't have tongues, tongues, so I just went into Greek, and the guys who were laying hands on me were like, you received it. Yes, you received it. Because, you know, you had that like, ah, let your tongue go. Ah, ah, it's coming, it's coming. And I'm like, nothing's coming, but I'm going to say it in Greek. And they were so happy. They went home going, God, use this today. The people received. <laughs> anyway, I'm sorry. I've been around too long. Um, and... Uh, <laughs> So, so I know I'm supposed to do the four spiritual laws with him. I'm supposed to tell him that he is not born again, that we are separated by sin from God, that he needs to pray this prayer. But really, he didn't ask me to get into a theological discourse. He asked me if he could play in the band. So against everything in my heart and brain and structures and systems and things, I had to ask myself, at which point in the journey were the disciples born again? And I had to wonder if they weren't born again after his resurrection, in which case they were even performing miracles prior without an understanding yet. Therefore, they were saved before they knew they were saved. They needed a revelation of their salvation. Anyway, a whole nother, are you okay with that, Pastor? We're still good. So there's a whole other conversation, and that's why you should treat unsaved people carefully, because they may simply be family unrevealed to you. And if you really want to get nasty on the topic, you should love unsaved people more because everyone else in this room has the same spirit of Christ and needs you less than the one who doesn't. And what is cruel is for people who have food sitting together and sharing it with one another and then patting themselves on the back thinking we're good sharers. No, you're not. That's when the guy who can't pay you back gets it. That you're a good, anyway. I wasn't supposed to, I'm sorry. I wasn't supposed to. Anyway, so you asked if you could, and so I said, come to band practice, which was like the easiest way of like somewhere in the middle, I can sleep at night. He might not come to band practice. Then problem solved. Came to band practice with all his like, all these things. They have weird names, crybaby and moaning and groaning sounds. I know all about that. And um, he brought them and he brought his guitar, which was worth about 100,000. And he had gone through the songs and he knew them, which immediately told me he also wasn't a normal Christian musician. Am I overdoing it, Pastor? I mean, so I just don't understand how you're going to come and sign up at band at Father's house. You're going to play in front of 2,000 people, but you can't save enough money to buy your own guitar and then learn how to strum it. You know, Jesus said, I'm going to try and do this with a smile because I get like that mean look. You know, Jesus said after he gave people the talents, the five and the two and the one, when they multiplied them, he said, well done, good and faithful servant. Most people think they just have to be good and not faithful. And some people think as long as you're faithful, you don't have to be good. That's rubbish. You have to be good and faithful. We want both we want you to be sure-footed, good on the one side, faithful on the other. As a preacher, I owe it to the 2,000 people who come at each service to be good and faithful. Be present on Sundays and be prepared on Sundays. And the musicians, please do the same in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. I'm sorry. I apologize for that. Uh, and, and we... Um, we were learning a new song that night. I, I used to go to band practice. I'm, I, I, there are too many things happening now, but I used to go to band practice and make cappuccino for everyone who came. So I'd get there early and I'd make cappuccino. And when they started, I'd leave. So I'd taken the orders and I'd gone to make the cappuccinos. I did a barista course because you've got to be good and faithful. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't serve coffee and make people go. It's lovely pasta when it's bitter as, you know. And... Uh, they were learning, this is amazing grace. 
No, grace, what have you done? Burden for me on a cross, right? I went and made the coffees and I came back out and opened the auditorium door and there's this guy kneeling on the stage next to his equipment, weeping. Because at band practice, he discovered what all this was about in the first place. And I just wonder if I'd asked him to do an obstacle course process first, if I might have lost the window of opportunity for his open heart. As big as it gets, and as much as I value systems, leave open that breathing space of possibility, of uniqueness, of extraordinariness. Leave it open. Because God could do something outside of the framework of our planning. And can I encourage you, never let the individual journey die in the massness of a, of a bulk walk. And let church be messy. Let people question whether you really are a church. Let them say you have smokers standing outside waiting to come into church. Let them say, do you know who else was there? I saw that guy from the paper with the fraud case there. Let them say that. Let them say that the people who were kicked out of one church, landed up in yours. Let them say that the people who they thought were terrible people were in your church service. Let them say that it really doesn't matter because the people who are talking like that are doing nothing to build the kingdom. You soon find out that people who carry one another's burdens learn to keep quiet very quickly because their hearts break for the people and they don't have a point to prove anymore. Don't have a point to prove anymore. So, every now and then I get an email from someone who visits the service to say they're very disappointed. They were in the service and I didn't preach enough about sin. Or that I didn't explain to these big crowds of people that not all of them are going to make it to heaven. In fact, one email said, do you know how many people in the room are Christians? Are you, would you even be able to tell me that? And I said to them, I, I, I am quite confident I can tell you that. You see, nobody came there except God drew him. So I think every single person in that room is somewhere on the road from hell. To heaven. And you don't have the right to decide where the gate is. Thank you.